Let's pray together again. Father, in this time that you've given to us, we come to your glorious word. It is your authoritative word. It is without any error. Uh, it is our standard for life and for practice. This word has been under attack always, ever since you began to speak to man. What you said has been under attack. Uh, Lord, help us to receive your word. Give us, as this, we just sang, the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And Lord, as the psalmist said, may you uh, open the eyes of our heart that we may behold the wondrous things that we find in your law. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wanted to uh, take the occasion of Mother's Day to kind of, even though we were only one sermon away from being finished with Colossians, to address, uh, I think, a biblical issue that is very appropriate for the day in which we, we live. Um, I think it's important for us to understand uh, that the culture that we live in is drifting further and further and further away from biblical truth. Um, and that can be seen uh, very obviously in the whole issue of what sociologists call gender dysphoria. Confusion about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and you hear all different kinds of arguments uh, on both sides. And I just I want to get us back to the Word of God on that, because I think ultimately uh, what God has said about it is the ultimate authority on it. Um, you see, the issue, we could look at it as a sociological issue, a psychological issue, a medical issue, um, a political issue, but ultimately it is a biblical issue, it is a spiritual issue. And uh, the main point that I want us to get, you, Andrea read the three verses that will be the primary uh, text that we'll look at uh, today. When we look at Scripture, the main point we get out of this, and we need to understand, is that God sovereignly created mankind with two distinct genders, male and female. And in doing that, God sovereignly did that, meaning he had the power to do it, the right to do it, and had a purpose for doing that. Uh, this is his world. It's not ours. We don't get to decide what happens. Next time you think you get to decide what happens, you stand out in a thunderstorm and you hold a lightning rod in your hand and say that you've decided that lightning will not strike you. There's a pretty good chance what you decide will not come true. This is our Father's world. He created it, and he's sovereign over it, and it's his. It's his to do with in whatever way brings him honor and glory. So what I want us to do is go back to this passage of Scripture, and, and I want us to, first of all, see uh, how the creation of male and female, that there are three things that, God, that, that teach us in that act about God. Because ultimately, because this is his world, we were created to bring glory to him. In fact, let's, let's just take a minute, because I think, it, I think you can never repeat this too much, to go back to the beginning of the whole story of what all the Bible is about. And it really, you can find it in four waves. The first wave is creation. That there was nothing there, that God existed, but there was nothing. God existed in the middle of nothing. He existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in order to glorify himself, he decided to create a universe of which we are the center, the crown portion of it. Uh, it's great to look at the skies. It was great this week to see northern lights and... I always like to look up at the stars and see all that kind of stuff. It's great to behold the universe that's out there, but all of that is all part of the fact that God has placed you and I, mankind, here for his glory. It all revolves around that. The second wave of that story is that the man and woman he created messed it all up. They disobeyed God. They listened to the lie 
that there was something better than what God had established. They only had one rule. Can you imagine living in a world with only one rule? And they couldn't even keep that one rule. They blew it. And because Adam was the head of the whole human race, his sin is passed down onto all of us so that we're all born with a nature to sin. We're all born spiritually dead and with a nature to sin. Now, we can't blame it all on him because we choose to do that. We choose to live by that nature. We choose to disobey God. We choose to listen to the same lies that there's something better than what God has declared. Well, God knew that that would happen, and even there, as he confronted Adam and Eve with their sin, he promised a redeemer. That's the third wave of the story. That God would send a redeemer because we could not redeem ourselves, And he did that in his son, Jesus, who died on a cross, who lived the perfect life that Adam was supposed to live. He became the better Adam and lived that perfect life. And he died the death that you and I should have died. He died in our place that we could have life in him. What a tremendous, tremendous story that is. Now think about this. If God had not meant what he created, when man deviated from what God created, if God didn't mean for that to be the way it was, why would God have sent a redeemer to set it back the way it was? Which leads us to the fourth wave of the story, and that is restoration. When we place our faith and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live in our life, and he begins a rebuilding, renewing, restoring process where he begins to recreate and restore the image of God in us. Romans 8, 29 tells us that we become conformed to the image of Christ. We start thinking like Christ and acting like Christ and seeing the world through Christ's perspective. And then that restoration will be complete when God finally calls time out on this world. And in a final act of judgment, he judges sin, and he creates a new heaven and a new earth and allows us to live now recreated perfectly. That's the story of the whole Bible. So you see, when we begin to talk about something as emotional and as controversial as gender dysphoria, we are saying that maybe God didn't get it right. And we need to address that. And what can we learn about God as we look back at this creation? Well, first of all, we learn about the magnificent design of God. All throughout the first five days of creation, God said, and there was. Or God said, let there be, and there was. Or God said, let this happen, or that happen, and it did. Then when God begins to create animal life, the Bible tells us he created animal life out of the dust of the ground. He, but then the language that he talks about, when he talks about creating Adam, in verse 26, let us make man in our image. Let us make let, let, let us become actively involved and, and creatively engaged in this. Not, let's don't just pronounce that man would appear. Could God have done that? Absolutely. God had just could have said, okay, let people appear. Pop! There they were. But God didn't do it that way. All of a sudden, the language of creation changes as God makes. And it's a very poetic word in Scripture. In fact, some have said that verse 27 is the first poetry that was, that, that, that was ever written. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. There you see the word created repeated three times for emphasis. God made with his hands, as it were, by his act, 
God created mankind. In fact, it gets even better over in chapter uh, 2 when God creates woman in verse 22. Uh, it says, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, He made into a woman and brought her to the man. This is even a different word, the word yaben, which means to build something. So you're thinking of something that has uh, an incredible design. So when God decided to create man. He didn't just speak it. He designed it. He made it. And when God brought about a man's helpmate, brought about the woman, he, he from the side of man created or made or built the perfect complement to go with the man that he had created. God actively involved in this creation. He was actively and intentionally creating what would be a corresponding pair. I think it's important that we take a minute, though, and consider in chapter 2. If you'll turn in your Bible there, notice what God said. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Never have truer words been spoken. Because most of the time when we men are left alone, we get in trouble. And God saw that from the beginning. I will make a helper fit for him. Now, let's take a minute and think about that phrase. That word helper, etzer. The word etzer is not a subordinate word. In fact, there are times that God is referred to as our etzer. God is our helper, and God is not subordinate. God is the sovereign of this world. So in, in calling this new creation, this woman that he was creating a helper, was not saying that he was making a secondary creation. And the fact that God uh, took from the side, literally not from the rib, but from the side of Adam, he didn't take from Adam's feet so that Adam could trample. He didn't take from Adam's head so that she could rule over. He, he symbolically built Adam's corresponding helper from the side that she would be beside him. A helper fit, suitable, corresponding, matching. Now there are a lot of ways, and we won't go into just the biology of it, uh, but there are a lot of ways that men and women are, are a compatible pair. Not the least of which is in God's instruction to be fruitful and multiply. No matter how many advances science tries to make, it is still God's design that a man and a woman come together and produce a child. That is why God built them with corresponding parts. They are, to, they are to be corresponding. If God didn't care about corresponding parts, it could have been Adam and Steve instead of Adam and Eve. But it wasn't. He created two compatible individuals by his grand design. So you see, the design of the creator of this world is reflected in our gender differences. So it's something to be celebrated. It's not something to be questioned. It's not something to say, well, I don't really think God did it right when he created me, or, or I don't think I was really created, or, or a lot of times there's not even any, any consideration given to the fact that maybe God did create. Uh, we've just taken God out of the equation altogether. And we, 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 we miss the fact that, the, that we, are, we are part of the magnificent creative design. The same God, you know, when if you had the opportunity to get a glimpse of the northern lights uh, over, o over this week, it's incredible. I mean, the explanation of it or the way the, the light reflects off the gases in the atmosphere and the, you know, the, the sun storm that creates all of that and all, it, it, the science behind it itself, it boggles my mind. And it's a wonder to behold. I, I love looking at, at um, I love looking at satellite pictures or, or um, telescopic pictures from satellites we've sent into orbit, or spacecraft that we've put into orbit that take pictures of the uh, the parts of the universe that we can't even see, and to see the magnificence of what God has done. But none of that, none of that is superior to the 
incredible sovereign design that God put into making man and woman. God magnificently designed us. The second thing we learn about God is we see the glorious image of God. Uh, back in chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And he used two corresponding words. The image, generally speaking, refers to something that is a representation of something else. It, it, and, and spiritually speaking, when the Bible speaks of us being created in the image of God, that doesn't mean that God looks like us, that God has two arms or two legs. He, he certainly did, at least for 33 years, when, when he took on the form of a person and, and through his son Jesus, and, and Jesus was God walking among us. But, but from all of eternity past and all of eternity future, to say that God, that we have the image of God doesn't mean that we, we physically look like God. It means that we spiritually reflect something about God. Well, think about this for a moment. Um, let's just look at two or three of the ways. We believe, based on this teaching of Scripture, that God exists all as one being, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You say, well, how can that be? I don't understand that. But yet, you and I exist as body, soul, and spirit. Three parts. Kind of hard to understand those two. Exactly which is which and what is what. But, but just like God is three in one, he created us to be three in one. What a magnificent thing that is. What a tremendous opportunity we have to reflect that tri-unity tri that God has with us. Another way that we do that, um, emotions. So, well, does God have emotions? Exactly. The book of Isaiah tells us that God is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We read in the scripture about God getting angry, about God being disappointed, but we also see that God was jubilant, and that God had joy, and that God was love. The fact that we have those emotions, and we're not just walking around like robots. We're not the walking dead, you know, just some kind of physical form going around, but totally emotionless. The fact that we, we emote is a reflection of the image of God. The fact that we have reasoning abilities sets us apart from other animals in creation. We have the ability to, to make moral decision. Other animals do not make moral decision. They react. Or based on conditioning, what they have been trained, or, or, or what has become a pattern in their life, they react. Or something causes them to act beyond their conditioning, they do. But, but there's not a, hmm... I've never known a dog to look at a bowl of dog food and think, you know, I really need to lose some weight. I think I'm going to ask my owner for the light version of this food. Or I've never known a dog at night to go, you know, my owners are trying to sleep. I really shouldn't bark at what I think I'm hearing outside. That just wouldn't be right to do. No, they, they bark because they're a dog. I mean, that's in their nature to do that. There's something moral about us that reflects the image. Even, even though the fall has tainted that, and sometimes the moral choices we make are not founded on good principles, we still base on some concept we have of what is right and what is wrong. Our concept may be flawed, but we... Those are just a few of the ways. We reflect the image of God. Now, that image has been marred by the fall. We talk about in theological circles, one of the big word, uh, phrases is used is total depravity. And um, a lot of people, that's just one of those, I like to think of it this way, as complete corruption. Every part of our being, everything about us has been messed up by sin. It's kind of like when your computer gets a virus. 
and and it doesn't you know it, it winds up affecting the operation of the whole computer not just that one little part of the hard drive that it's on that's what sin sin is a, a is a cosmic virus that has corrupted the display of the image of God in our life and caused it to go astray the word likeness it's a companion word which also means to look like or to, to represent something. A likeness of something meant that if you looked at that likeness, it reminded you <coughs> of the very thing that that likeness was intended to represent. A former uh, youth minister of mine used to have uh, in his office a painting on the wall. I forget the... It, French painter, I forget his name now, but it's a picture of a pipe. And the caption underneath the picture, written in French, but I'll translate it in English because I can't pronounce the French, was, this is not a pipe. And I remember the first time I looked at that, I was able to figure out what it, what it said. And I said, I don't get this picture. He said, what? I said, if it's not a pipe, what is it? He said, well, it's not a pipe. I said, it is a pipe. I've, I've seen, you know, I'm older, I've seen plenty of pipes. It's, it's not a pipe. And he kind of grinned. He said, it's a picture of a pipe. He was right. So while we are not the exact image of God, it should be that like a picture of a pipe, people can look at that picture of a pipe and know what that pipe looks like. People should be able to look at us and know what God is like. They should be able to listen to the words that we speak and know what God would say. They, they should look at the things we do and notice what God would do. God placed his imprint on our life and his intent for our life so that we would reflect that. Now, there are, both genders are necessary to do that. There are ways that females represent characteristics of God that men cannot. Think about when Jesus saw the cities and he looked at them, woe to you, Chorazim, woe to you, Bethesda, and he was, he was woeing all the cities and he said, how many times like a mother hen would I have brought you under my wing and sheltered you under my wing? A very female gender natural nurturing response. God talked about the fact that he birthed Israel. Gave birth to them. Not begat them. That's a different word. Birthed them. Ladies, you have instincts that are God-given instincts that reflect the nature and character of God that we men got unplugged years ago. And they're not, they're not operable in us. By the same token, there are ways that men operate that reflect certain characteristics of the nature of God that women are not intended to do. So God brought about a corresponding pair, and within each member of that pair, he placed part of his image to reflect his likeness so that people could look at them individually and look at them together and get a full picture of who God is. Now, you go messing with one gender or the other, and you begin to blur the lines of who God is. You begin to take away that distinctive of what God is trying to tell the world about himself. And that's why there's one of the reasons there's so much confusion about who God is now. We are intended to imitate God in our words, our thoughts, and our actions. Then, third thing we learn about God is we see the sovereign purpose of God. In verse 28, <clears throat> God blessed them, plural. And God said to them, plural, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the, air, of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God told them, and by the way, the grammar in the verb is the grammar in the verb is second person plural. You all do that. Together, 
you will do this. We cannot accomplish what God has given us to do without being complementary to each other. Male and female are complementary genders, and, and we cannot accomplish the purposes that God has. It takes both. And there are ways in which women are able to do that, to accomplish purposes that men cannot. And we just won't speak of, we won't only speak of the specifics, but, you know, without each other, we cannot be fruitful and multiply. And we will not fill the earth. It won't take many generations that if you all of a sudden mix the genders and there's no more heterosexual couples, that there won't be any people. Now, granted, I know that's an absurd conclusion to draw but it just goes to show using the absurd it takes both to accomplish the purpose of God it takes both to subdue the earth to live this life to to get through life together we need each other we need each other's perspective we need each other's gifts we need each other's abilities we we need each other and together we exercise dominion over what God has created, not dominion over each other, but dominion together over creation. Now granted, God has established within the home roles of male leadership and a wife that is supportive and helpful and encouraging, but it takes both. Both are equally important in God's eyes and both are equal in God's eyes. So we see that God created intentionally male and female. It wasn't just a whim. God intentionally created us this way. He did it to display his grand design. He did it to reveal his glorious image, and he did to enable his sovereign purpose. As we close out today, this is what I want us to think of. I realize that for the most part, I am probably preaching to the choir. So, what are we supposed to do with this? Living in this day and age, knowing that what I have just preached, many people will disagree with. And if you believe it and hold true to it, people will disagree with you. What do you do with it? Well, three things I just want to share with you as we close. The first one to remember, it's important to remember, that birth assigned genders are a biblical truth, and we need to believe that. The reason I state something so simple as that is because it's, I get the temptation. It's easy to listen to the voices today and, and to hear so many people say, well, you just don't understand. I don't think I was really born to be that way, or this is just the way I am. Why can't you just do you and me do me? And why can't you just let me be? And we hear, you know, God is all about love. So just, you know, we, we all, you know, all kinds of arguments like that. Specific, intentional, gender design and creation is God's plan. And it's a biblical truth. So it's important that we believe that and that we not let popular opinion or popular voices, even, even if it's a, a thundering voice of a majority who feels another way, if we're the only one to stand on biblical truth, then we need to stand on biblical truth and not give in to it and say, well, I guess you're right. No, you're, you're not. You're not right. Let God be right and every man a liar, as Paul said biblical truth and we need to believe it. Now, on the other hand, the second thing, recognize that those who have gender confusion have been blinded by Satan. So we don't need to get angry. We don't need to shun. We need to have compassion. We need to realize that these, are, these are men and women who are missing out on the best that God has for them. And I don't know how that affects you. It breaks my heart. That they have listened to, you know, we didn't go this far in Genesis, but you go to chapter 3, when Adam and Eve were tempted to sin, Eve tried to say, well, God said we're not supposed to eat that. And the devil said, but did God really say that? Oh, 
He's not, don't listen to him. He's not going to hurt you. God had ulterior motives. He's just trying to keep you back. And you know what? That's the same. The devil has not had to come up with any new strategies. Those same strategies have worked ever since creation began. Ever since the first fall. It works on me and it works on you. Because anytime we sin and disobey, knowingly disobey God, we're saying, well, I know God said this, but I'm going to do this anyway. Because, well, we listen to that old lie. It's easier to get forgiveness than permission. I want you to understand that's really not a funny thing we should be saying because we really shouldn't, we should be working on obedience, not needing either permission or forgiveness. But that's what the devil tries to tell us. That's what he tries to tell us about gender confusion. So we, we need, to, we need to, to recognize that this is a spiritual issue and, and there are people out there that are held in bondage. And these people that are held in bondage are, have an appointment with the wrath of God, the same wrath of God that you and I had an appointment with, but God, who is rich in love and mercy, and by His grace saved us and redeemed us, and should He not do that for them, they are rushing headlong into the, into the, to the judgment of God. And that should break our hearts shouldn't make us angry. It should make us sad. It shouldn't make us shun them. It should make us go to them to serve and to love them. And then the final thing I would say is this. Engage lovingly and confidently, knowing that Jesus died for sins and can set anyone free. I don't know many people that when they were saved woke up that day and said, you know what, I think I'll get saved today. Or at least not when the work of God began in their life. I don't know very many people who were just totally oblivious to God and all of a sudden just said, hmm, you know what, I think I'll, I'll, I'll decide to be saved today. And that may have been a process. God may have began working on their heart as a child and, and continued to, to nurture that and bring that up and only later in life did they finally respond to that or, or whatever the case may be. But the same thing is true. These are people who are choosing a path other than God. And so if we pray for them and if we lovingly engage, but engage confidently knowing that we believe what Paul said in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, has the power to turn any wayward heart back to God. And so, I want to encourage you on two levels. A, don't give in to our culture's definition of sexuality, of gender. Don't give in. It's God's truth. God has the right. God established the truth. It's His world. It's His right for it to be His truth. You are His child. Walk in His truth. But all the while, for those who are not walking in that truth, lovingly serve and share the gospel and show them Jesus. Because here's what will happen. Because God has placed his image in us and his likeness in us. Those of us who believe and who trust in him as God transforms him, as we begin to live our life and the glory of God begins to show through in our life, then we're going to have the opportunity to get a hearing from those who need to hear the gospel. So don't shun, don't turn away, don't condone. You can't, I mean, it's biblical truth. You have to believe biblical truth. So I'm not saying you should accept and condone it and say, well, it's okay. It's not okay. But that doesn't mean because they've rejected God, you reject them. Lovingly engage and share and show Jesus. It's a complicated issue complicated world in which we live. But understand that we serve an all-knowing, all-powerful God. His Holy Spirit lives inside of you. If you are committed to His truth, and you are committed to His plan, and you are committed to His work in your life, 
then know God will use you. Stand for his truth. Don't give in. Don't change what you believe. Don't, don't call right what God has called wrong. But also don't take those who are in the wrong and, and close the door on their salvation by not being willing to love them and share Jesus with them. Look, I know, I know some of you work in that environment and work with people who are that way. I know some of you have family members that are having gender and sexuality issues. I understand that. And I know it's hard to love somebody so much and to see them so far off from something you know to be true. But ask God to give you the strength to stay firm to what is true and ask God to give you the ability to love in Christ those who stand greatly in need of his love.